Last time we talked about a transition from a Roman world to one in which non-Roman peoples came to control territory that once belonged to the Roman Empire. We looked at the four major successor states to Rome in Western Europe in the 5th century, the Franks in Gaul, the Visigoths in Spain, the Ostrogoths in Italy, and the Vandals in North Africa. We looked at this map that showed these four major kingdoms, the Frankish kingdom up on the top of the map, the Visigothic kingdom in Spain, the Vandal kingdom in North Africa, and the Ostrogothic kingdom in Italy. And then we talked about how the military invasions of the Emperor Justinian in the middle part of the 6th century ended the kingdoms of the Ostrogoths and the Vandals and weakened the kingdom of the Visigoths. So on one level, it's not surprising that once things settle down, the kingdom of the Franks is the strongest post-Roman state in the West. And we saw last time that the position of the Franks increases even more once Islam emerges and Arab Muslim armies push the Romans from Syria, Palestine, and all of the southern shore of the Mediterranean. While the Arab Muslims are beating back the Romans, though, the Franks managed to defend their, their territory against the Arab attacks uh, in 732. And ultimately what we saw was the rising power of the Franks and the declining power of the Romans in the West made it so that Charlemagne could strike an alliance with the Pope that led to his crowning in the year 800 as Roman Emperor. Now this crowning makes it seem like the Franks had become fully and completely the, real, the equal of the Romans. But the reality is far more complicated. Because while they may have been the most powerful and best organized group in the West, the Franks still knew full well that they lived under the shadow of the Roman Empire. They were more powerful in the West than the Roman Empire that survived, though they were probably still less powerful than it overall. But the Franks also knew that the empire at its height was far greater, uh, had far greater political, military, and cultural authority than they ever would. And the cultural legacy of the Romans still helped determine all kinds of things about how people living under the Franks saw their world. So it determined the sorts of things they were taught in school. It determined the kind of books that people read. It determined the sorts of things they wrote about. It even determined what literature looked like. And so this also meant that when the Franks sat down to write about their leaders, they turned immediately to models that came from the Roman world. They just simply had nothing better. And so today we're gonna to look at two authors and the way in which they drew upon Roman models to present the two greatest Frankish kings. So we'll start with Gregory of Tours and his present presentation of Clovis, and we'll then turn to Einhard and consider the way that he wanted us to think about Charlemagne. And in the end, we'll see that each borrowed a different Roman literary model for describing kingship, and that each was also very much aware of the image of a king that these models created. But we should start with Gregory of Tours. So Gregory was born in 538 to a prominent local family in the city of Clermont-Ferrand in what's now France. He was consecrated Bishop of Tours when he was uh, about 34 years old in this year 573. And this apparently wasn't a surprise. It was kind of a family business to be the Bishop of Tours. 13 of the previous 18 Bishops of Tours had been related to Gregory somehow. Tour, though, was a special kind of center. So you see here um, on this map, uh, right below where it says Conquests of Clovis, you see the city of Tour. Um, now, Tour was at the center of the Frankish kingdom. And it was a place where a number of roadways came together. It was also the site of a shrine dedicated to St. Martin of Tour, the most important saint in the entire Frankish kingdom. And this meant that Gregory always had contact with some of the most prominent people in the kingdom. But Gregory was not just politically astute, he was also a very skilled writer. So he had as good a literary education as the times permitted, and he also proved to be an incredibly productive author. So he wrote a life, a biography of St. Martin of Tours, a work that served to enhance the reputation of the city of Tours and attract even more tourist traffic to it. He also wrote a history of the Franks, a 10 book long work it describes everything in Frankish history from the creation of the world until 594, the year of Gregory's death. And the material about Clovis that you read for this week forms a part of that history. What Gregory aimed to do in the history of the Franks 
was relatively straightforward, at least on a basic level. This was a royal history that glorified the Frankish kingdom in which Gregory lived, and in particular, the kings he served. And at the same time, it made this case in a particular way. The history did not just celebrate the Franks for their political achievements. They were also celebrated for what they had accomplished religiously. And this is important because the Franks were a powerful Catholic kingdom that was surrounded by pagan or non-Catholic Christian rivals. So during Clovis's life, to the south of his kingdom was the Visigothic kingdom in Spain, a Christian kingdom that was, however, not Catholic, but belonged to a different sect of Christianity, a sect that uh, scholars now call Arian Christianity. And Italy, to the south, and Burgundia, to the sort of south as well, um, these were Arian Christian kingdoms as well. And to the north and east were pagans. And so what Gregory set out to do was to show how the Franks differed from these rivals. And he did this in a number of ways. So when he spoke about the Visigoths, he wrote about their Arian beliefs and sometimes how these led the Goths to persecute Catholics. And so here's an account of this. Um, when he's talking about the Gothic king Yorick, who crossed the Spanish frontier, persecutes Christians in Gaul. And then Gregory gives all sorts of crazy, um, elaborate uh, opinions about what happened. Um, cutting off the heads of people who would not subscribe to his heretical opinions, imprisoning priests, bishops being driven into exile, um, blocking the doorways of churches. Now, this is all pretty um, exaggerated stuff, but the Catholics described here are actually Romans. They're not yet subjects of the Franks. And so what Gregory is doing is using this ideal of an Arian Gothic king that persecutes real Catholic Christians as a tool to eventually set up one of the moments that define the Franks. Because this territory that's being attacked by the Goths, the Arian heretical Goths, is at this moment Roman territory. It's not yet Frankish territory. And yet the Christians in this territory who cannot be defended are Catholic Christians, like the Franks will become. And so what Gregory is doing is he's setting up this idea of the Goths as this heretical, a horrible, persecuting other, and the Romans as a, a set of political entities that cannot defend their citizens against this. And of course, what Gregory is also doing is setting up the idea of the Catholic Franks coming in and protecting these Christians as the power uh, that has the capacity to prevent them from being persecuted by heretics. It's a way of setting up the transition of, of Gaul moving from Roman rule to Frankish rule and explaining why this is something that's necessary because of the objectives and the larger plan of God. But Gregory's history is really designed to give a full account of what happens to the Franks. And so he tells us how the Frankish territories expand, um, how in 407, the Franks expanded their territory into territory in the Northwest that was once controlled by Romans, but for the most part, the Franks remained good Roman allies. So Gregory describes how they fought alongside Rome against the Visigoths in 425. They also lent real service to the Romans in battles against the Huns in the 5th century. But in the course of the 5th century, things begin to change. Because the Franks had been largely loyal, the Roman state allowed them to expand and develop a real power base in Gaul. But eventually, at the end of the 5th century, the Franks fully emerge from Roman political dominance. And this is because of Clovis. Now, for Gregory, Clovis is the figure who determines the character of the Frankish kingdom. He doesn't found the Frankish kingdom. Um, his grandfather does that. But Clovis is the person who really determines what the Frankish kingdom will ultimately be like. And uh, he's the figure who will define it as a religiously orthodox and powerful kingdom that in a way positions the Franks as the successor who first challenges and then surpasses the Romans in what's now France. Now, both of these are key points that Gregory develops in the chapters, develop, uh, the chapters connected to Clovis's career. And so Gregory begins by talking about how Clovis positions the Franks above the Romans. He writes it in 486, Clovis launches an attack against some of the remaining Roman power in Gaul. And it's interesting how he frames this. 
He says, in the fifth year of Clovis's reign, Siagrius, the king of the Romans and the son of Egidius, was living in the city of Soissons, where Egidius himself used to have residence. And Clovis marched against him, and they fought against each other, and the army of Siagrius was annihilated. And at that time, a great many churches were plundered by Clovis, for he still held fast to his pagan idolatries. Now, what's interesting about this is Siagrius is not really a king of the Romans. Uh, what he is, is he's a military commander of some sort stationed in northern Gaul, kind of like a French King Arthur. Um, but what basically Siagrius controls is territory that is still Roman-controlled territory occupied by Romans, but it's completely cut off from the rest of Roman territory. This isn't, um, this is what's left over of the empire as, uh, or after the Franks and the Goths have kind of cut the rest of it apart. And so Siagrius is what's kind of the ruler of an island of Roman territory amidst the sea of barbarian kingdoms. And so when, when Clovis takes him down, what he's doing is he's basically eliminating the last vestiges of Roman, of independent Roman rule in Gaul. Now there's also something interesting, there's something else that's interesting here, because Gregory makes clear that at this point, when Clovis is attacking Siagrius and this, this island of Roman territory, um, he's still pagan. And so when he attacks Clovis's, or when he attacks Siagrius's territory, Clovis plunders the churches because that's what pagans do. But later in his reign, what we see is that Clovis has a change of heart. So Gregory has told us already that uh, Clovis's wife was a Catholic Christian and throughout her marriage to Clovis, she prayed that he would convert to Catholicism. And finally, Gregory says, war broke out against the Alemanni. And so this is to the, the sort of east, the southeast of uh, Frankish territory. And war breaks out against the Alemanni. And in this conflict, Clovis was forced by necessity to accept what he had refused of his own free will. It so turned out that when the two armies met on the battlefield, there was great slaughter, and the troops of Clovis were rapidly being annihilated. And so he raised his eyes to heaven when he saw this, and he felt compunction in his heart, and he was moved to tears. And he said, Jesus Christ, you who Clotilde, his wife, maintains to be the son of the living God, in faith I beg your help. If you give me victory over my enemies, I will believe in you, and I will be baptized in your name. And so what happens to make Clovis a Christian is he's fighting a battle that it looks like he's going to lose. And if he loses this battle, he likely will lose his life as well. And so Clovis does what Constantine had done earlier. He prays to the Christian God. He asks for Christian help. He receives it. He wins the battle and he converts to, to Catholic Christianity. And so Gregory gives you this story um, directly and consciously in imitation of what Constantine had done. And the reason he's doing this is because Gregory is positioning Clovis as the figure who makes this Frankish kingdom the Roman successor state, the Catholic, Christian, barbarian kingdom that will follow the Romans and serve as the religious protector of those Romans who are being oppressed by Arian Gothic rule. And in the course of his reign, what Clovis does is he attacks and defends these Catholic Romans in the south of France who are living under oppressive non-Catholic kings. So what Gregory is doing is he's positioning and telling a story that explains why Catholic Romans should be content with and, and in some ways even happy to transition from post-Roman Gothic rule to Catholic Frankish rule. And in the course of his reign, the Franks absorbed territories from smaller barbarian states like the Burgundians, the Alemanni, and ultimately even the Visigoths. And so overall, Constantine is the model that Gregory wants to use to explain why this post-Roman kingdom should be the um, should be the natural successor of, well, the Romans in this territory. But what's interesting is Gregory is using this as a kind of foundation story. You know, the, the conversion of Clovis to Catholic Christianity 
expresses what or why the Frankish kingdom becomes what it will become, the major Catholic power in Western Europe. What's interesting, of course, is when we turn our attention from Clovis to nearly 300 years later, um, the career of Charlemagne, what we see is that Einhard does something different. So Gregory has turned to Eusebius to give this foundation story of the Catholic Christian Frankish kingdom. Um, but when we're talking about Einhard and Einhard's life of Charlemagne, Einhard turns in a different direction. He doesn't turn to the foundational texts of the Christian empire. What he does instead is he turns to Suetonius. And he reworks the structure of a Suetonius life in order to make sure it conforms to a new Christian post-Roman context. And there's a really significant shift here because it shows a real and dramatic difference between the ways that Gregory was conceiving of what Frankish power would be and the sort of maturation of Frankish power that Einhard wants to describe. But before looking at Einhard's life of Charlemagne, it might help to take a brief look at Einhard himself. This is a nice uh, image of Einhard. So Einhard is born around 770 to a wealthy family that lived near the city of Mainz in modern Germany. Uh, he showed a lot of province, uh, promise as a student, and so he was sent for his schooling to the nearby monastery in Fulda. There's Fulda. Um, and the, the monastery of Fulda is actually a remarkable thing. It was set up in 744 to be basically the center of intellectual life in the Frankish kingdom. Uh, its founders toured monasteries around Italy and Western Europe to get ideas about how to make this the premier center of scholarship. Uh, and then what they did is they started buying books and manuscripts, things that they could stock the library at Fulda with so that the intellectuals who are being trained at Fulda have access to all of the best materials in the Western world. In 774, Charlemagne himself took control over the monastery and wanted to make it into the intellectual sort of crown jewel of his empire. And so while Einhard excelled at Fulda, it was certain that he would come to the attention of the king. This is what Fulda was designed to do. And so by the 790s, Einhard, who was the, the genuine star of all of the monastic and educational training going on in Fulda, was summoned to the court of Charlemagne. Um, his talents were so great that Charlemagne wanted to reward him. And it seems he would never leave the service of the court. So Charlemagne favored him and gave him opportunities, and Einhard did a good job for Charlemagne. And so he was rewarded for his service to the king uh, in 815, a little bit after Charlemagne's death, when Charlemagne's son gave him a large estate with its own church and 20 peasant families to work the land. But he continued to work at the court of Louis, Charlemagne's son, and wrote official letters from the court, and then also wrote the text of the official laws being issued by the court. And from 825 to 840, uh, Einhard remained a really prominent figure with connections to all of the major people in the kingdom. Now, the life of Charlemagne was written around 826 or 827, and it would end up being a bestseller. So we have over 120 different versions of it, uh, different manuscripts. They came from the royal palace itself and all over the kingdom. So this is an image of the life of Charlemagne. Uh, it's an illustrated manuscript. It's, of course, quite pretty. Uh, but Einhard makes it clear at the outset what his goal in writing this text would be. Einhard says, I thought it would be better to write down the things I know about Charlemagne rather than to suffer the most famous life of this most excellent king, the greatest of all men of his age, and his remarkable deeds which men of our own time can barely imitate. Uh, I don't want them to be swallowed up in the shadows of oblivion. And so what Einhard is claiming he would do, um, and what he said he feared, was that Charlemagne would be forgotten. And so Charlemagne, his deeds needed to be written down. Otherwise, the shadows of oblivion would swallow them away. Now, in reality, uh, there was no danger in Charlemagne's deeds being forgotten. There were a large number of texts written about Charlemagne, um, and a large number of different types of materials that recorded what Charlemagne had done. But what Einhard was doing in reality is that Einhard 
um, saw the opportunity to frame the career of Charlemagne in a completely novel way. He's writing for an audience that knew Charlemagne's deeds. Uh, one of the main figures that Einhard seems to be directing this towards is Charlemagne's son, Louis, and a host of courtiers who had worked for both Louis and, and for Charlemagne. And so they knew what Charlemagne had done. Um, and there were court annals in the kingdom that recorded this, uh, and there were materials in Rome that recorded this. Um, what Einhard is looking to do instead is write a text that contextualizes the achievements of Charlemagne, and to do it in a way that focuses specifically on the greatness of the man, uh, and does it in a way that frames this greatness in a surprising and new way. And so what Einhard um, is looking to do is to write a biography of a political leader. And this is a remarkable new step. Because what Einhard knew is that there were biographies of political leaders that had been done, um, but it hadn't been done recently. The only biographies written in the Frankish kingdoms, aside from the biographical snippet of Gregory of Tours that focused on Clovis, had been lives of saints. Um, biography was, at this point in time, actually something that was reserved more or less for presenting the details of holy figures. And so what Einhard could do, and what some people did do, was write up the life of Charlemagne in that way. Write the life of Charlemagne as a saint, as a religious figure. But that's not what Einhard ch chooses to do. Um, instead, what he chose to do was to write a more conventional biography of a political leader. And the work develops it por its portrait of Charlemagne very deliberately. Um, it begins, as you'd expect, with Charlemagne's family, and then it continues in the in the continu it continues in the normal pattern that these texts take. And it's also clear what Einhard is trying to do here. Einhard is trying to follow the model of Suetonius, a model that no one in Western Europe had followed for hundreds of years. Um, and we'll talk in a little bit about why. But what you can see when you look at this text is you can see that the model of Suetonius is evident throughout. Now, when he begins, he begins with Charlemagne's family. And here Einhard confronts a bit of a problem. Because if you remember the background from last time, Charlemagne's father, Pippin, had been mayor of the palace. He had been the individual who overthrew the old Merovingian dynasty that was made great by Clovis. And so on the one hand, Charlemagne was descended from a king, and that's wonderful. But on the other hand, um, that king had taken power in a coup. And so that's not perfect. Uh, but Einhard disposes of the controversy easily enough. Einhard says, The Merovingian family, from which the Franks used to choose their kings, is commonly said to have lasted until the time of Childeric. But although to all outward appearances it ended with Childeric, it had long since been devoid of vital strength, because the real power and authority in the kingdom lay in the hands of the chief officer of the court, the so-called mayor of the palace. And he was at the head of affairs, and there was nothing left for the king to do but to be content with his name of king, and his flowing hair, and his long beard, and to sit on the throne, and to play the ruler. But the mayor of the palace took charge of the government, and of everything that had to be planned or executed at home or abroad. And so what Einhard does to dispose of the problem that Pippin took power in a coup from the Merovingians, is he says basically, well, yes, the Merovingians were in charge, but they weren't really in charge. All they did was they sat on the throne and they sort of were there for ceremonial occasions and they did the 8th century version of, you know, cutting the ribbons at the shopping malls um, and they looked pretty and they had nice hair and they had a long beard. But the mayor of the palace actually did everything anyway. And so what happened was um, Pippin took power because it just was natural to do that. It was just natural that the person who actually had power should nominally also have the authority over the kingdom. And Einhard um, assumes his audience knows the Pope signed off on this. And so this is not actually a coup. This is just an acknowledgement of reality. Um, now, this gave Einhard a basic plan for how he would celebrate Charlemagne. Uh, like Pippin, Charlemagne had real authority that came both from his natural ability to govern the state 
and from the religious sanction of the Pope. And so once this method is established, uh, Einhard then gives an outline of the basic plan of the work. He says, you know, it would be folly, I think, to write a word concerning Charles's birth and infancy or even his boyhood, for nothing has ever been written on the subject, and there is no one alive now who can give information on it. Accordingly, I determined to pass that by as unknown, and to proceed at once to talk about his character, his deeds, and such other facts of his life as are worth telling and setting forth, and shall, I shall first give an account of his deeds at home and abroad, then of his character and his interests, and lastly of his administration and death, omitting nothing worth knowing or necessary to know. Now this statement is very interesting because it shows that Einhard knew that the audience had certain expectations for what a biography of a political figure would look like. And he knew that he couldn't live up to them completely. And so even though Einhard was taking on a task that had not really been attempted in Latin for a few hundred years, he also knew that people at the court had read Suetonius and knew how the text worked. Um, and this is important to understand because we know for a fact that people at Fulda had access to Suetonius, because we actually know the manuscript of Suetonius that Einhard read. So we actually have the physical object that was the entry point for people like Suetonius, or people like Einhard and people in the court of Louis to read Suetonius. We know they have it. We know they accessed it. We know, in fact, the exact text that they physically touched when they accessed it. So they knew what Suetonius said, um, and they knew how Suetonius worked. And so what Einhard is doing here is he's saying, I know that you know how Suetonius works. I am telling you that I don't think it's necessary to do everything that Suetonius does, but I will acknowledge for you the fact that, you know, I'm aware that you have expectations for how this text will work, and I'm explaining to you why this text will look a little bit differently. Um, so please, Einhard is essentially saying, um, indulge me as I skip the birth and education se sections of the biography that you all know to expect. And so what follows are a set of catalogs of Charlemagne's deeds. And we get 10 chapters out of 33 chapters total devoted to describing the individual wars that Charlemagne fights. And we um, then reach chapter 15, and Einhard gives us a really interesting summary of this, and I'm not going to give you the full summary, but what he says is, uh, well, I give it to you. I won't read it for you. Um, Such are the wars, most skillfully planned and successfully fought, which this most powerful king waged during the 47 years of his reign. And he so largely increased the Frankish kingdom, which was already great and strong when he received it from his father, that more than double its former territory was added to it. And then we have this long description of all of the territory that uh, supposedly Charlemagne conquered. Now, this is a strategy that you have, of course, seen before. Einhard gives you this long list to prove the memorable statement at the beginning of it. He has told you the Frankish kingdom was more than doubled by Charlemagne. And then he gives you this long list that you can't possibly follow. You can't possibly internalize. You can't possibly track all of the things that he's described here. But that's the point. This is like when um, we're told by Suetonius that Augustus found a city of brick and turned it into a city of marble. And then you get the long lists of all the things that he built. This is Einhard deliberately imitating that structure in Suetonius. And his audience would know that he did it. Um, and so Einhard is copying this strategy so that the short statement about doubling the territory of the Franks is in a sense proven by this long list that documents all of the conquests. Now, you don't have a map, you don't need a map. You don't need to see in, you know, bright colors the territory that Einhard or that Charlemagne added to the Frankish reign. Uh, you have it all here. And that's, of course, quite interesting. Um, but the length of this is in itself proof of the claim that Charlemagne doubled Frankish territory. And so the effect here is the same as the life of Augustus. The list reinforces the claim that Charlemagne conquered a lot of land. But there's actually something very interesting um, in making the claim in the same way that Suetonius does. 
because this also reinforces the similarity that Einhard is trying to draw between Charlemagne and Augustus. Uh, you know that Suetonius made a claim like this. You know that Suetonius proved the claim just like this. And so when you see Einhard making a similar claim in a similar way, with a similar structure, it not only reinforces the, um, pr the truth of the claim he's making, but it also reinforces the association of Charlemagne with an actual successful and famous Roman emperor. And so these, uh, these tactics um, are designed to show very clearly that even though Charlemagne um, had not conquered Constantinople, even though he hadn't unified all of the Christian territory in the Mediterranean, it didn't matter because Charlemagne is at least the equal of the great Roman emperor Augustus. And this idea of equality with the Romans is something that Einhard develops in other ways too. So Einhard makes it clear at the outset that this is a text that's going to draw on the classical Roman world in many different ways. <clears throat> so in his preface, Einhard quotes from Cicero. He says, I submit this book. It contains the history of a very great and distinguished man, but there's nothing in it to marvel at besides his deeds, except the fact that I, who am a barbarian and very little versed in the Roman language, seem to suppose myself capable of writing gracefully and respectably in Latin and to carry my presumption so far as to disdain the sentiment that Cicero has said in his first book of the Tusculan Disputations to have expressed when speaking of the Latin authors. Cicero's words are, it's an outrageous abuse both of time and literature for a man to commit his thoughts to writing without having the ability either to arrange them or elucidate them or attract readers by some charm of style. Now this saying of the famous order might have deterred me from writing if I had not made up my mind that it was better to risk the opinions of the world and put my little talents for composition to the test than to slight the memory of so great a man for the sake of sparing myself. Now this looks like a statement of modesty, but it's also a very deliberately framed one because it's, an, it's a statement that Einhard sees himself as a figure who is very much working in the Roman tradition. What he's doing is he's saying, um, compare me to Cicero. I might not measure up, but still, at the same time, the Roman tradition is the only thing that rises to the level suitable to describe what Charlemagne did. But the other thing that is intriguing about this, that's interesting about this, is Einhard is being falsely modest, because Einhard is one of the most skilled Latin writers of that moment. And Einhard's audience, as they read this, what they will see is Cicero's claim that it's an outrageous abuse of time and literature for a man to commit his thoughts to writing without having the ability to arrange or elucidate them by some charm of style. Einhard's readers will see that Einhard actually does have this capacity, that Einhard himself is denying a claim to equality with Cicero, but making it at the same time. It's subtle. By introducing this criticism of Cicero, what Einhard is doing is he's inviting his readers to compare Einhard's writing and Einhard's style with that of the ancients. And he's asking them to judge. And what Einhard is doing when he makes this comparison is Einhard is writing from a position of false modesty. He knows that what he does, what his Latin does, what he writes and how he expresses himself will measure up. And he wants you to make that comparison because he wants you to understand that the only way to appreciate both his talents, but also especially the achievements of Charlemagne, is to use this Roman frame of reference, this ancient, lost sort of model that the West had not been able to measure up to before Charlemagne. And so what Einhard has done is he plugs Charlemagne into this Roman tradition by showing that the age Charlemagne created through his empire was very much the equal of the great Roman period that preceded it. 
Now, and Einhard will go on to develop this in other ways too. So in chapters 17, 18, and 19, he talks about the construction projects and cultural developments for which Charlemagne was responsible. And then chapter 25 talks about Charlemagne's studies. And Einar tells us that Charlemagne had the gift of ready and fluent speech and could express whatever he had to say with the utmost clearness. So he took lessons in grammar from the deacon Peter of Pisa, uh, another deacon, Albuin or Alcuin of Britain, a man of Saxon extraction, was the greatest scholar of the day, and he was Charlemagne's teacher in other branches of learning. And the king spent much time and labor with him studying rhetoric, dialectics, mainly um, philosophy, and especially astronomy. And he learned to reason and used to investigate the motions of the heavenly bodies with greatest curiosity and intellectual scrutiny. And so what Einhard is telling us is that Charlemagne had a Latin education, a traditional, classical, grammatical education that also involved rhetoric, philosophy, and astronomy, and, we're told, even a mastery of Greek. Um, he was every bit the kind of philosopher king that the Roman world had traditionally admired. But what Einhard makes clear is that in other ways, Charlemagne surpassed even these ancient Roman models. Because Einhard Charlemagne was not just as successful as an old Roman emperor, but he was also extremely pious. And this was shown in particular through his interactions with the popes and his willingness to labor on behalf of Christian religion. And so we're told, for example, that his wars against the Saxons in the, um, Western, or the eastern part of his empire were motivated in part by the fact that they were pagans. And he was looking to use his power uh, to expand Christianity. And so the war with Saxon, the Saxons lasted so many years and was at length ended by their acceding to the terms offered by the king, which was a renunciation of their old religious customs and the worship of devils and acceptance of the sacraments of Christian faith, and a union with the Franks to form one people. And so what Einhard says is the war with the Saxons worked on a number of levels. It was a war of conquest, for sure, but it was also a religious campaign. And the goal of it was to take the Saxons and remove them from the worship of their traditional deities and bring them to the acceptance of Christianity. And so the war was a war of conquest. That's true, like the wars that old Roman emperors had fought in the same regions, but it was more than that. It was also a war to bring Christian religious sensibilities to people who did not have it. And for Einhard, this shows that Charlemagne surpasses what the um, Roman emperors that Suetonius had talked about actually had achieved. Einhard later tells us that Charlemagne also used his resources to build churches and expand the reach of Christianity. And he even offers this interesting detail. He says that Charlemagne is very forward in helping the poor, and that in his gratuitous generosity, um, which the Greeks call alms, he not only made a point of giving in his own country and his own kingdom, but when he discovered that there were Christians living in poverty in Syria, Egypt, Africa, Jerusalem, Alexandria, and Carthage, he had compassion on them, and he used to send money over the seas to them. And the reason that he did this, um, to make friends with the kings beyond the seas, was that he might get help and relief for Christians living under their rule. Now, there's, this is a really interesting passage that presents uh, Charlemagne as the champion of Christians living abroad. But it's interesting to see the regions that he mentions. He mentions regions that are under Muslim control. And traditionally, the sovereign that was most connected with this uh, group of Christians, and, um, and this is quite legitimately something that was happening in the reign of Charlemagne, was the Byzantine emperor, the Roman emperor in Constantinople. And we know that the Roman king uh, and the Roman, the Roman empresses at that moment enjoyed strong relationships with the Bishop of Alexandria, the Bishop of Antioch, the Bishop of Jerusalem, um, even summoning them to a church council in 787 uh, that the Franks were not invited to. But what Charlemagne, what Einhard is doing here is he's saying that the traditional um, protective things that the Romans had done for those Christians weren't working anymore. The Romans in Constantinople no longer had the capacity to support those Christians and to give them the resources that would allow them to survive. And so Charlemagne stepped in. 
And it was, of course, Charlemagne's um, responsibility, but also it's a, a testament to Charlemagne's power that he has supplanted the Romans as the protectors of Christians all around the world. And so the Empire of Constantinople was receding while the Frankish Empire of Charlemagne was expanding. And this is a point that Einhard wants to make very clear. But the clearest way in which Charlemagne's piety is presented by Einhard is through Charlemagne's relationship with the Pope. And Einhard develops this in a number of ways. He makes it clear, for example, that Charlemagne's invasion of Italy in the 770s came about because the Pope asked him to do this. And this is actually, it's actually true, he did. Um, he was induced by the prayers and entreaties of Hadrian, the bishop of the city of Rome, to wage war on the Lombards. His father before him had undertaken this task at the request of Pope Stephen. Although Charles seems to have had similar, or rather just the same grounds for declaring war that his father had, the war itself differed from the preceding one because Charles did not cease after declaring war until he had exhausted the satirist by a long siege and forced him to surrender at discretion. What this means is that uh, across the 760s, 770s, actually even the 750s, the Franks had been induced by the popes to come in and protect the city of Rome from the Lombard kingdom based in the city of Pavia in northern Italy. And they had done this in the past, but no one had actually taken over the Lombard kingdom. Instead, they would come in and defend the papacy and then basically retreat after getting a treaty from the Lombards. But Charlemagne went in and he besieged Pavia and he conquered Pavia and he conquered the Lombard kingdom and he absorbed it into Frankish territory. And so what Einhard is saying is that this is something where the piety of Frankish kings going all the way back to Charlemagne's father had been so strong that they would go into Italy and defend the papacy. But what Charlemagne did was he did this even better. His piety was still so strong that when the Pope requested help, Charlemagne would give that help. But Charlemagne gave better help. Um, his capacity was much more than what even his father could do. And this is why we're told um, that Charlemagne had such a strong relationship with Pope Hadrian. It was out of piety and mutual respect. And so we're told, for example, that when he learned of the death of Hadrian in 796, uh, he wept as much as if he'd lost a brother or a very dear son. And so all of this sets up Charlemagne's crowning as emperor by Pope Leo in 800. And Einhard makes you believe that this is a natural result of the full complement of Charlemagne's virtues. He was pious, he was loyal to the papacy, he was a cultural leader, he was a military um, success, and he was a tremendous ruler in every way. He was completely worthy of being seen as a Roman emperor, and Einhard chose to write this text, a biography of Charlemagne modeled on Suetonius, because it would show people that Charlemagne belonged not just alongside Eusebius' Constantine, but alongside Suetonius' Augustus as a leader who brought about a new, true, and genuine Roman golden age. And so the step that Einhard takes here is revolutionary. It's significant, it's powerful, but it's also something that Einhard's audience saw as completely justified and justifiable.